the church is a people on mission. Jesus calls us to be his witness, to spread his message from person to person to person. So how do we be on mission today? To share Jesus' story here in our city and to the ends of the earth. Greetings, friends. Brad Jersak here again, visiting you there at the meeting place in Winnipeg. And uh, today I want to begin my talk with a, an account of a wonderful conversation I recently had. Now, I suppose that's already an iffy thing to say these days. Uh, high risk in some circles to talk about God and definitely forbidden in polite company. Uh, but this exchange was truly special. And my conversation partners were self-identified across the map. So we did have some ex-Christians. We had some current Christians. We had agnostics, pagans, heretics, uh, by their own account. And each of us decided that we were welcome to express our evolving or devolving faith in God, what God is, what God is not, uh, without any fear of judgment or contradiction or debate. We were just going to take our turn sharing how we saw it. And I heard these incredible stories of faith found, faith abandoned, faith evolving, faith adapting. And uh, I must say we had very different convictions about who or what God is or isn't. And yet there was this amazing humble agreement that whoever or whatever God is, really defies human comprehension. And that would even be the testimony of someone like the Apostle Paul, who says, you know, the love of God, it, it defies grasping. We're going to need supernatural illumination even to glimpse it. And that who or what God is, is generally beyond what our words could tell. And so we have a word for that. It's called ineffable. You just can't put it into words. And we all sort of felt that. And yet there was this amazing consensus. Uh, we came to this point where we said, without knowing exactly who or what we're talking about, all of us sensed a spiritual presence among us and within us and bigger than us. And that this presence was so gracious that even acting as if some loving reality cares about us, we could begin to experience restoration. And so the, the man who named himself a pagan said, I don't know what God is or isn't, but I do need, we, I know, I know we need a personal relationship with that God. Not bad. Uh, the heretic said, I don't know exactly what God is or isn't, but I do know this. It's a spiritual presence and it's in me. And it's far, far bigger than me. And it's with us here now. And then we had an agnostic speak up. He said, I don't think I believe in God. Um, my parents were atheists, and I can't say I'm an atheist, but I do know that whatever higher power there is, it's here in this conversation. And it's restoring me to sanity. In fact, he had now been sober for a month after an addiction that was causing him to act out at least three times a day. Uh, real transformation just by acting as if God. And then there's the atheist, and he said, I've never believed in God, but I am a spiritual person. And I remember when my, when my sister died, I called out to God. And, um, and, and I'm, I'm still really hesitant to use that term, but you know what? I'm three years three years sober after a life of uh, addiction. And so very interesting that these folks were willing to experiment the, with the idea of a loving presence, of a, a spiritual reality, of a power greater than themselves. And in that engagement, every single one of them 
was experiencing some kind of transformation, not based on like, are you in the club yet or have you bought in, but just a sincere openness as if there might be someone who wants to help them. And in that openness, actually experiencing measurable, observable new freedom. And so that was really fascinating to me. Um, It's as if Jesus were coming to them anonymously, as if Jesus were able to speak good news in their context. And that's what I want to share with a little bit today is, is Paul in the city of Athens in Acts chapter 17, where we see that he has a contextualized gospel. In other words, um, contextualized means sharing the good news in the language and culture of those we're engaging. It means looking for common ground across faiths and cultures where we can begin a conversation and where we might find that there's a lot we can affirm. So Paul, I believe, had a very contextualized gospel. And we'll see that in Acts chapter 17 um, when he's speaking uh, to the Athenians. I also would say that there's, there's limits to his contextualization. So he brings a gospel where there's a value added message. What is Paul's value added gospel? What is unique about his good news of Jesus? And what makes him decide that it's important to share? And so once we've established some common ground, what new ground would our gospel break? And then I want to do a little PS, Paul's second thoughts about Athens. You know, he he got hooked into evangelism by debate in Athens and the fruit wasn't great. And he does a little debrief of that experience in his engagement with the Corinthian converts thereafter. So let's begin there. Paul shows up in Athens. He's waiting for Timothy and Silas, who are still back in Berea. And while he's waiting there, he's looking around Athens and he's provoked or even incensed by the idolatry he saw. And so he begins starting to reason, to debate in both the synagogue and the marketplace with Jews, with God worshipers, with idolaters, with philosophers. And we see that it begins with something that's very important to him. He's proclaiming the gospel of Jesus and the resurrection. The gospel of Jesus and the resurrection. And as he's doing this, down in the marketplace, he bumps into two kinds of philosophers. The Epicureans, which were sort of hedonists, and Stoics, who practiced a kind of acceptance and a love of fate so that they wouldn't be so rattled by circumstances. So Epicureans and Stoics, they were both philosophers who were looking for answers to this life in this life. And when they run into Paul, they, they're they a little bit tweaked by his, his gospel of Jesus and this idea of a resurrection. In David Bentley Hart's translation, he, he says that they call him a seed-picking ditherer, a spermologos, a spermologos. And uh, they want to know, what, what are these foreign gods you're talking about? What is this new teaching, this strange idea? And in Athens, uh, new teachings and strange ideas had once been a capital crime. It's, it's why Socrates had been put to death there. Um, in this text, it says now they're mainly at leisure, just looking for new ideas. I guess they're bored and they want to engage with something. But the reality is that the Jews in that city were well established and they were exempt from those kind of charges because uh, they had established their faith as ancient. And so there was a kind of respect for Judaism. But now this Christian sect came along and it's talking about a man who had lived within their own lifetime, who had died and uh, been resurrected. And that sounds new to them. What's going on? And so uh, Paul begins to engage with them, and he wants to start with his kind of radical contextualization, his belief that they had serious common ground. And he says this, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, their idols, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. Therefore, The one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. 
He's really granting them a lot there. He's granting that they do worship this God that he's about to proclaim. Like Peter in Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius, he points out and he even affirms their devotion to God or the gods. And he validates it at some level. In the case of Cornelius, Peter goes on to add that God has heard Cornelius' prayers, seen his almsgiving, reckoned him acceptable to God, and even calls him a righteous man. And that's before he heard the gospel. Now, Paul doesn't go quite that far in some ways, but he does go so far as to validate their idolatry as a kind of ignorant but good faith search for God. He thinks that counts at some level, that those who search for God in the wrong ways in the wrong places are still searching for God and that God knows that. And in fact, he assures them that the true God is not far away from anyone. He has placed them in their geography, in their families, within their boundaries, so that they would reach out for him, to grope for him, and perhaps even find him. He says he's not far away from anyone. In fact, in him you live and you move and you have have your being. And he even says, by the way, we're all God's children. We're all God's children. Well, that's not very... um, uh, much like the tradition I grew up in. I I had believed that God's children are only those who'd accepted Jesus, are only those who'd been baptized into the body of Christ. And and yet here, here Paul is affirming that they're all God's children. And, and not only that, he does it by quoting two hymns of theirs to Zeus. Interesting. So he's using their hymns to their God, and he's affirming something about our God and building a bridge. And here's some of the things that Paul then declares as as he's building this bridge. He says, God, who made the world and everything in it. There we go. He's the creator God. Many faiths can affirm a creator God. And since he's the Lord of heaven and earth, He doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. Well, of course, we have temples. Even Christians have uh, church buildings. But but he's not confined to these temples. Even the Jewish temple did not confine God, according to Isaiah. Nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. So he's a generous gracious giver of good things. And he's made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. And he's determined their pre-appointed times and their boundaries and their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in hope that they might grope for him, find him, though he's not far from each of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said. In Titus, he actually calls it their prophet. For we are all God's offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Oh, far bigger than that. God transcends these things. Now, truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, they could all acknowledge the limitations of our minds, our notions, our concepts, our constructs of God. But now, now he commands all men everywhere to repent, which is to turn to him. And that's actually not a big step. Um, In all of their worship, they were attempting that. So where's his common ground? Well, that we have God, the Father Almighty, the creator of all, the giver of life. We have a God who desires all people to seek him and find him and that he calls people to turn to him and that this God will be the judge of all. Now, so far, so good. We're still on common ground. He's affirming what they already believed and a God they already worshipped. Now, here are the two citations. He takes one from Epimenides, hundreds of years before Christ, in a song called Cretica. It's about Crete. They fashioned a tomb for you, high and holy one. Cretans, always liars, evil beasts, idle bellies. What, wh- why are they liars? Because they believed God is dead. 
And he said, but you're not dead. You live and abide forever, for in you we live and move and have our being. That is Epimenides singing to Zeus, that whatever the creator God is, however you conceive him, however badly you think of him, whatever he is, he's not dead. He's not dead. And then he also cites Aratus, another philosopher, in his book, Phenomena. Again, it's about Zeus, about the creator God, the maker of all things. And, and that song goes this way. From Zeus, let us begin. Him do we mortals never leave unnamed. Full of Zeus are all the streets and all the marketplaces of men. Full is the sea and the havens thereof. Always we, we all have need of Zeus. We're also all his offspring. And this is the part Paul quotes. And he is, in his kindness unto men, gives favorable signs and wakens the people to work, reminding them of livelihood. He tells what time the soil is best for labor of the ox and for the mattock, and what time the seasons are favorable both for the planting of trees and for the casting of all manner of seeds. For himself it was who set the signs in heaven. He's talking about the constellations. And for the year devised what stars chiefly should give to men right signs of the seasons to the end that all things might grow unfailingly. Wherefore, him do men ever worship first and last. Hail, O Father, mighty marvel, mighty blessing unto men. Hail to thee and to the elder race. Hail, ye muses. Write kindly everyone, but for me too, in answer to my prayer, direct all my lay, even as is meet, to tell the stars. And so Paul has picked up these two songs that were familiar to them, popular to them, and he established that as common ground. It says, you believe in God, the creator who's good and gracious and kind, who's made all things and fills all places, and that's who I worship too. That's who you're worshiping. We have this in common, and that's how he begins with contextualization, using their own songs and hymns. Um, now, one of the things I'm trying to do in my city is connect with the Sikh people. And the reality is we have the biggest Sikh population in all of Canada, bigger than Toronto or Surrey or, or Vancouver. In Little Abbotsford, we have three Sikh temples. And uh, in Abbotsford proper, up to 35% of, of our population is Sikh. And it just seems to me we're very disconnected from our neighbors. And I want to know and love these brothers and sisters, but how am I going to contextualize? How am I going to find common ground with them? Well, one thing I'm doing towards that end is um, I've committed this year to reading their entire scriptures. Well, at least on audiobook in English. And it's about 80 hours worth. And as I'm listening, I'm hearing these same kind of refrains, things that would be common ground. I wonder where that will go. Get a load of some of these lines from their scriptures, from the Sri Guru Granth Sahib. The true Lord is true, forever true, and true is his name. He is and shall always be. He shall not depart, even when this universe which he created departs. He created the world with its various colors, species of beings, and the variety of maya. Having created creation, he watches over it himself by his greatness. He does whatever he pleases. No order can be issued to him. He's the king, the king of kings, the supreme lord and maker of kings. And those whom the Lord blesses with his glance of grace are saved. They are lovingly attuned to the Lord. This is the time to speak and sing the praise and the glory of God, which brings the merit of millions of baptisms. The tongue which chants these praises is worthy. There's no charity equal to this. Blessing us with his glance of grace, the kind and compassionate, all-powerful Lord comes to dwell within the mind and the body. My soul, body, and wealth are his forever and ever. I am a sacrifice to him. God the merciful has himself bestowed his mercy. He has totally removed the poisonous pollution of egotism. And so we have here this beautiful hymn that I could sing to my God as they sing to their God. I'm wondering if we're singing to the same God sometimes. It sure sounds like it. 
It sounds like Paul thought that when the Athenians sang to Zeus, perhaps also our God could hear him and hear them and hear um, all those who are seeking God. So that's how radical contextualization can get. And if we stop there, well, we'll probably be in trouble. But we won't stop there because Paul does establish limits to contextualization. In other words, his gospel doesn't stop with common ground. It breaks new ground with a value-added gospel. And this is where Jesus Christ comes to the table. Paul then begins to preach this to the Athenians. He has appointed a day on which he'll judge the world. Okay, so far so good. We all believe that. In righteousness by the man who he has ordained. Ah, the human being, the human God, Jesus Christ. And so now he introduces incarnation. He has given assurance of this to all by raising them from the dead. That, that's the new part of the message. Not, not just like a ghost or a spirit, but a resurrection of a human who claims to be God and does what only God can do. And that God has raised this Jesus from the dead. And it's to him who we turn. Well, that's a tough sell in Athens. It's a tough sell in the world, actually. You know, in my conversations, I find that uh, many, many people believe that God is our loving creator and that we do have common ground. I can even say this, those who can confess this loving God is gracious and merciful and that this God invites us to devote ourselves to him in love and to live our faith by loving our neighbors. The Sikhs all believe that. My 12-step recovery friends who are agnostics but believe in a higher power believe that. Um, Paul seems to indicate that these are children of God, according to Paul. Our brothers and sisters, acceptable, righteous, according to Peter. And yet Peter and Paul preached Christ. Why? Why and what is the added value of sharing our gospel? Well, A, the incarnation. The creator has entered this world in the flesh of Jesus Christ and that in Christ we find a God who bears our wounds. The ones I've endured, the ones and wounds that I've inflicted. And while my friends may say God is love and the universe is kind towards me, I need, I need a God who who bears my wounds. And I tell them that. And you know what? Most people actually get it. Thomas needed that. He didn't confess Christ because he saw the uncreated light shining from his eyes. He confessed Christ as his God, the one I can kneel before and worship because he saw his wounds. You know, the only universe that loves me is the one who bears scars. And that's something I feel the need to share with people. Second, in his resurrection, Christ is risen. Christ is alive. Christ is with me. Christ is in me. And I'm finding a lot of Christians even nowadays that have deconstructed so far that resurrection is virtually an option to them. Does it really matter if he was raised or not? No, what matters is that he is alive. And without the resurrection, he's not alive. I... I could adhere to the teachings of a dead God who was truly wise, but I can't lay my life down for him. I won't bet my children's life on him. Not one like that. I need need the one who's alive, who bears my wounds, who lives with me now, who hears me, and who actively participates in my life. John Wesley saw this too. You know, he he discovered as an evangelist in North America that the Inuit people he met already knew their creator. They already worshipped the creator. They already prayed to the creator. And they had both uh, seen and responded to the true light that had come into the world. And yet, he preaches the gospel. Why, when, when he was asked why he proceeded to share the gospel with people who already had responded to the light. Here was his value-added message. Two points. That in Jesus Christ, we can enjoy the full benefits of the redeemed life. 
our full inheritance. For Cornelius, that meant going from a God-fearer kind of obedience to Abba-loving intimacy. When he heard the gospel, he was filled with the spirit of sonship that now he's not a God-fearer, but he's one who cries out Abba from his heart. Papa. So as children of God, Jesus shows us the fullness of our inheritance as children. And in Jesus Christ, second, uh, Wesley says, we can also then know the full assurance of salvation based on what Christ has done, has completed, has finished. In other words, I could say to the holy pagan, yes, you're pursuing God. Yes, he sees it. But you know what? In Christ, there's absolutely nothing his blood can't wash. Your guilt is removed. Your sins are forgiven. Your shame is washed. Your prayers are heard. Nothing, nothing can separate you from God's love, not even death. And people need that assurance. It's the value-added gospel of what Jesus brings to that table of discussion, of conversation. All right, I want to finish up briefly now with Paul's second thoughts, his debrief in Corinth. You know, he moves, in a sense, from debate back to encounter. In Paul's uh, missionary journeys, we read again and again that he would preach Christ and him crucified, that the Lord is risen, and then he would have these uh, signs and wonders would follow. He would bring people into encounter. They would experience healing and transformation. But when he gets to Athens, I don't see him doing that. It says that he's incensed or or triggered, provoked into debate. And even though he's, he's bringing the very best of contextualization, I think it really is a model. Um, he gets back to the death and resurrection of Jesus as a matter of almost like apologetics, as a, a debate or a discussion or, you know, He's wrestling with them, and the fruit isn't that good. Not many people believe there. And they say, well, we'll think about it. And you know what? Sometimes that's just how it is. But then Paul goes on from there to Corinth, and we find that in Corinth, he goes back to his bread and butter. And here's how he describes it in 1 Corinthians. He's reflecting on his visit to Corinth after Athens. He says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. It is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent. I will frustrate. And then he asks in verse 20, Where is the wise person? Where's the teacher of the law? Where's the philosopher of this age? In his mind, he's saying, Athens. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs. Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. And then he'll go on to say in chapter 2, When I came to you, I didn't come with wise and persuasive words. He had in Athens. But in Corinth, he lays that down and he says, I resolved to know nothing with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise or persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest in human wisdom, but in God's power. And it seems like um, when, when Paul came to Corinth, he moved out of debate back into a kind of gospel where he led people into encounter, into encounter. And We read in Acts chapter 18, uh, verse 7, that when Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titus, a worshiper of God, Crispus, a synagogue leader, his whole household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians believed and were baptized. And so so we we see this um, beautiful contextualization. We see the limits of that contextualization where there is an added value gospel of the God who bears our wounds and is risen and lives within us. But we also then uh, move beyond debate into encounter, whatever that looks like. That can look like, can I pray for you? 
Can you share with me your struggles? And can we begin to uh, uh, a living connection with our Lord Jesus Christ? Well, I think I want to bring that to this point in prayer. And so would you pray with me? So, Father in heaven, we thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has revealed to us by the Spirit the God who bears our wounds, the God who bears the wounds we've endured and inflicted and has risen and is with us and in us today. Lord, would you let your light so shine that we can see that light in others who are on the journey, those who have already been searching for you, who've cried out to you, that we would have a message for them that uh, works in their context and affirms what they've already seen and invites them to even more. And Lord, even today, I pray that you would lay your wounded hand on our hearts and that where we need freedom and healing and transformation that you would pour your healing love into my brothers and sisters from the tip of their head to the top, bottom of their toes, body, soul, and spirit. That you would speak to them today, that you would show them in their hearts that you're alive and that you're real and that you're with them and that you're for them and that you're for their neighbors and have already been reaching out to them. Lord, would you give us words that would be winsome and powerful? Would you accompany the good news message with demonstrations of transformation and healing? We pray these things in your good name. Amen. Thank you so much, everyone. And uh, it's been a delight to be with you. I hope to see you one day. Bye-bye, Hal. Welcome here, Brad. <laughs> um... Brad, we just received teaching from you. I know you haven't just, uh, like you're not in um, fresh preacher mode right now. We've just received your teaching that you had pre-recorded for us. Uh, it was a blessing as expected. I'm just going to uh, make sure I can look at you here. Um, so thank you. I have some questions for you. And I was talking to our mutual friend, Paul Walker, and he says, you're the best, hold nothing back. Uh, so I'm going to hold nothing back. Here's the first question, Brad. I love the conversation you had with the people of different beliefs. Do you think that could happen in any place? And how would that look like to start? Yeah, I don't see why it couldn't happen in any place. I, I suppose that there, um, it does depend a little bit on how open they are to having a conversation. But I believe that um, my openness and my willingness to listen first gives me some level of permission then to respond to them. But it's not like I, you know, I walk out down the street and have these conversations every day. I find myself in contexts where there's a hunger for it, a need for it, and then, um, and, and, and then wonderful and surprising things can happen. But, you know, uh, I gave an example in terms of, let's say, a, a, a group where we had people with addictions that are ready to talk about this stuff. They'd already bottomed out and they're looking for, looking for answers. And so that, of course, lends itself to better conversations. So these were people who were predisposed to spiritual conversations? In a way, I mean, yeah. I would say they were predisposed to transformation and that opened them up to spiritual conversations because, you know, some were atheists, some were agnostic, some were, um, most would say they were spiritual, but, and maybe that's enough, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, this sense of uh, spiritual openness to explore ideas um, rather than locking ourselves down into dogmas. And I know that uh, Christians can do that and, and so can those who are antagonistic to faith. Uh, there is a kind of fundamentalism out there that is hard for conversation, but yeah. And I almost take it this way. If anyone is willing to dump their problems on me, uh, the conversation has begun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thanks for that, Brad. You manage attention in your teach between contextualization, but contextualizing with limits. 
right? Paul had limits. This question pertains to that. Is it possible that others may know the God we worship as Christians and be firmly devoted while calling God by a different name or subscribing to another religion officially? I think so. Um, I'll give you, I'll tell you a strange story. Valerie Carr is a Sikh woman who grew up in California. She was a victim of a lot of racism and all of her Christian friends in school told her she was going to hell. Uh, she became, a, she became a, a nominal Sikh until college and then her grandfather took her to the temple. And at the temple, she had a profound experience of the God of her childhood and the kind of things that she was hearing there were about the grace of God, the mercy of God, knowing God, not through rituals, but through love, things that you and I would be very familiar with. Well, she had such a renewal that it angered her that the Christians had abused her this place. So she marched out of the temple and down the street to find a church where she was going to rebuke them. Um, the first church she got to was locked though. And then the second one was also locked, but she heard a, um, an organ playing inside. So she knocked on the door and the woman inside came and opened the door. And instead of rebuking her, Valerie asked, could I come in and listen? So she ends up sitting in this Christian church surrounded by the images of Christ and stained glass and the gospel stories portrayed in color in that way as she's listening to this organ music. And then she had a strong sense of, the, of Jesus speaking to her, but he spoke to her using the words from her scriptures. Now, um, and in the aftermath of that, she began a movement called the Love Revolution, and a lot of churches come have her speak, but she speaks still as a Sikh woman. What's going on there? My friend Chris Green, he, he and I talked about this the other day, and he said it this way, um, that Jews and Christians and Muslims for sure, but I also would dare say Sikhs, Hindus, maybe Buddhists, um, at least in their philosophers by medieval times, they all came to agree on this, that whatever or whoever God is, is beyond being and infinite. And because God is infinite, nothing can inhibit God from being what I need. And so from my perspective then, um, I believe, you know, as a Christian in the, in the God revealed in Jesus Christ, who has shown us that his father is infinite love. And that means he can be what Valerie needs him to be. Um, and I, maybe at the end of the day, she won't say, oh, the Christians were right after all. What she might say is, oh, the, the God I've always loved has revealed himself to me in Jesus. And that's exactly what happened to her in that church that day. How this all plays out in the end is quite a mystery to me, but I, 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 that is kind of what I was trying to say also about, um, uh, about the Inuit people that John Wesley ran into. They'd already known the true light who has come into the world and enlightened every man, which is John chapter one. And so they didn't yet know him net, by the name we know him, and I would also say that there are things that we think about God or they think about God that are actually hindrances to knowing God. And so it's not to say that all paths equally lead us into a knowledge of God, but we do have a God who will travel any path to find someone. Yeah, I got a follow up question as you were speaking, and I think it, you, you've already touched on this, but they just give it to, to you really straight. So does this mean that all roads lead to God? Why would we share Jesus's story with anyone? Yeah, and that's that again is John Wesley. So yeah. do all paths lead toward God? No, some in fact lead away from God into fear, into bondage. Um, some Christian theologies do the same, by the way. And so if someone, um, let's say these Inuit people um, know God and and have experienced God somehow and are responding, why share Jesus with them? And so Wesley's idea was this, I want to take them like Peter did with Cornelius from being God fearers into God lovers. I want them to know that, that death has been conquered in Jesus Christ in a way they had not known. I want mm -hmm. them to know that their sins are already forgiven and that they don't need to spend a life of, of religious uh, striving in order to appease some 
some God who, who requires sacrifices. So, um, you know, does their current knowledge of God and their response to the light they've been given, is that saving knowledge? Probably. But mm. is it the fullness of their inheritance? No. And so I want to share what I know of the fullness of their inheritance and how, uh, how they can come to know um, the, the one who, who has made eternal life possible for them. In the meantime, they may also add something to my understanding of God that could surprise me. And that, that takes some humility for Christians to admit that, I think. Hmm. Thank you for sitting in that tension. That's, that's really good. Humility for Christians to know what others might teach us about God. Um, okay, let's close with this question. What common ground do you see in our Canadian culture? So as we seek to contextualize the gospel to our neighbors, to our friends and family, what common ground is there and uh, how might we engage that? You know, across Canada, um, I'll, I'll do a comparison. I think that the highest moral value in the United States is freedom, but it has a shadow side that I would call self-will and getting what I want. In Canada, by contrast, I think our highest moral value is tolerance. And that too has a shadow side in which we might say, well, there's no such thing as truth. Um, and you can do whatever you want and I will tolerate that. But I, I don't think that takes us as far. So maybe we could begin there and say, you know, um, in Canada, we really believe in the importance of living and letting live. Uh, but let's not just tolerate each other. Let's let's take it the next step and begin to fellowship with each other, and and probably then I mean the the human experience is is we all undergo the the difficulties of the human condition, and um, and if I remove intolerance from my my tool belt, then I can begin to talk about how how our common experience of the human condition. Um, let's say how I worry about my children. Well, that's common to everyone. All right. Now, I wonder if there's a, do we believe there's a higher power or a spiritual reality or some ultimate truth that might alleviate that, those kind of worries? And let's each share with each other now what you think that might be. And uh, without judgment or condemnation and tell our stories together about, you know, so on a practical level about how I'm living life day to day, um, I, I want to say yes to tolerance, but move well beyond that. And that's, again, the value added sort of uh, love one another call that we've been given. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not afraid to say God loves you to my neighbors. Um, but I earn that moment as well mm -hmm. through listening. Yeah. Well, thanks for that, Brad. Um, I'll, I'll turn you to... Uh, well, we'll see if you can even see us. Can you see some people there? I do. There they are. Hey, everyone. Uh, well, Brad, why don't you send us off with a blessing? Thank you. You have already blessed us, um, but send us off. I would love to. Um, so thank you, Father, for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who's given us the Spirit, and he's shown us the infinite love of a God who will be what we need you to be for us. I pray that uh, we would move just beyond our ideas of you into real encounters with you that transform us from the inside out. I pray that you'd give us ears to hear our neighbors and eyes to see where you're already at work with them, that we, like Paul and like Peter, like Wesley, um, could, could find common ground where conversations begin and lead to real love for one another. Mm. So I pray especially for that, that the supernatural love of God that flows from the wounds of Jesus would also flow from our hearts into our city. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.